Dear students, uh, the next lecture continues the uh, male genitalia histology. Now the second part is coming, which includes the uh, penis, but first I'd like to describe the uh, gross anatomy of the penis to understand the histological structure. Uh, the penis has three major parts. Uh, the first is quite hidden. This is called root of the penis, which includes the crus of the penis, which originates from skeletal elements, uh, partly from the ramus of the ischial bone, then in front from the inferior ramus of the pubic bone. Uh, we have two on each side, but in this case we don't see it because it is still covered by a skeletal muscle called ischiocavernosus. Uh, and the third uh, is the bulb of the penis or bulbous penis. This is attached to the uh, perineal membrane or urogenital diaphragm. We mentioned that this is the tra uh, transversus perineal profundus muscle with its uh, fascia layers and this is now the inferior fascia. Uh, this is uh, covered by the bulbous spongiosus muscle. So we have two pairs of muscles, ischiocavernosus around the uh, crura of the penis and the bulbous spongiosus, we have two, but they are united along a, a sagittal, uh, sagittal located connective tissue raphe. As you see, they uh, extend until this point, approximately, so they don't see, they don't uh, uh, continue forward to the body of the penis, which is the next major part. The function of the ischiocavernosus is, uh, with the contraction, we are able to uh, increase the efficiency of the erection because we have a certain uh, peripheral venous drainage from the penis in the erection and if we contract this muscle it is uh, blocked. And the bulbous spongiosus is important for the removal of the last drops of the urine in case of urination and also, and this is very more important, uh, the uh, 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 periodic contraction of the muscle in ejaculation uh, propels the seminal fluid uh, to the vagina from the urethra. We will uh, return to this later. Uh, the next part of the uh, penis is the crus, I mean, sorry, the corpus or body of the penis or shaft of the penis, uh, including two corpora cavernosa, corpus cavernosum, and one uh, corpus spongiosum. And uh, the uh, corpus spongiosum is, which continues at the end in this conical enlargement, this is called glans penis, and I like to highlight that the corpus cavernosum is not part of the glans, it is just embedded in this concavity. Uh, so this is a kind of ladle, as Professor Santagato described this. This is the stoke and this is the spoon uh, for uh, getting the soup, for example. Uh, the uh, posterior margin of the glans penis is called corona glandis. This is quite sensitive in uh, the penis. So these are the three major parts. I mentioned the muscles as well. Uh, quite similar in female, that's why I took this uh, photo. Uh, we have two crura of the clitoris, surrounded by the ischial cavernosus, and then these are reflected, this is quite hidden, in the body or corpus of the clitoris, which terminates in the glans uh, clitoris. And uh, we have two uh, bulbs, so in female, we have two additional uh, erectile bodies, not only one, as it was in men, uh, two bulbs of vestibule, and these are surrounded by bulbous spongiosus muscles. So in female, the bulbous spongiosus muscles are separated. Now, next topic is the uh, urethra. Uh, it has quite uh, elongated uh, uh, length, so 18 to 22, 22 centimeters. Don't worry, it's not the penis size, this is the uh, urethra. As you see, it's much longer because we have a certain part which is not related to the penis. So it starts in the uh, urinary bladder, uh, in the internal, at the level of the internal urethral orifice, and immediately uh, from the wall of the uh, bladder, we have the internal urethral sphincter uh, or sphincter vesici, which is made by the smooth muscle uh, cells. And this is under the sympathetic influence, so it is innervated uh, with the sympathetic uh, nervous system and it is kept uh, closed uh, with the tonic sympathetic activation. Uh, under the uh, sphincter, the inner sphincter, we have the prostate. We studied this, that on the posterior wall, what we see from here now, 
we see this green, which is the elevation called seminal colliculus with three openings, uh, larger openings. Uh, we mentioned this, the prostatic utricle in the middle and the two ejaculatory ducts. And above, we have a, a mucosal fold, the uvula of the bladder or uvula vesicae, and below the urethral crest. Now, under the prostate, uh, we have uh, another sphincter. So one is above, the other is below the prostate. This is the, the easiest to memorize. And it is related to this membrane, which is located here, the urogenital uh, diaphragm or perineal membrane. And uh, we studied last time that this is the transversus perineal profundus skeletal muscle. And its innermost part around the urethra forms a sphincter. This is the sphincter urethra or sphincter urethra external, external urethra sphincter if this was the internal. And uh, this is under the influence of the pudendal nerve, more precisely the dorsal nerve of uh, the penis. And uh, this is uh, a somatomotor innervation because it's skeletal muscle. So the first part of the urethra this way is the prostatic part. Second part where the sphincter is, is the uh, membranous part because otherwise this is where it pierces the uh, perineal membrane or urogenital diaphragm. Then the urethra enters the penis to the spongy part of the penis, corpus spongiosum it means, and that's why this is the spongy part of the penis. This is the longest part. And at the end, uh, we have a little dilated part. This is the navicular fossa after the boat-like uh, shape. And at the end, normally on the tip of the glands, we have the outer orifice, the external urethral orifice. Uh, so prosthetic part in some textbooks uh, this first part, which is through the wall uh, of the bladder, has a distinct name. We don't teach it, so that's why I don't want to overload your memory. Prostatic, membranous part, and spongy part. Uh, we have, if you want to insert a catheter, some constri constrictions in the uh, urethra. You have to know this. Uh, first, we have a dilated part, so no any problem. Then, behind the navicular fossa, especially in newborn, we may have a, a mucosal folds or fold, uh, which can cause a, a, a little blockade or difficulty to insert the catheter, then nothing. And we have again a dilated part somewhere here, where the urethra enters the uh, corpus spongiosum. And then we will see very soon we have flexure, and uh, uh, we have the first or second constriction at the level of the external urethral sphincter. Then uh, we may have a difficulty uh, in the prostate where we have the protrusion, the posterior wall by the uh, central colliculus, and at the end, uh, the next sphincter is the fourth constriction, which is the uh, level of the internal urethra sphincter. Um, here you see the flexures, what I mentioned. This is the mid sagittal plane, and here you see two flexures in the flexed penis. One is the uh, pubic flexure, that is the distal one, and the proximal is the uh, perineal flexure. Or if we, uh, if we relate the flexures to the uh, symphysis or pubic bone, then the uh, proximal one is the subpubic, the other one is the prepubic flexure. Uh, the prepubic flexure can be deleted with the elevation of the penis. So this, this is what we use in case of the insertion of the catheter. Uh, but the second one is uh, always uh, left here. No, and that's why I want to tell you the story what my friend told me. Uh, there was a patient who visited him with a chronic abdominal pain in the lower region. It uh, extended for two years, I heard. And the first, you know, the rule, the first step, according to the rule, is to examine the patient through the rectum with digital examination. And uh, uh, he tried this, and he felt a protrusion on the anterior wall of the rectum. So he tried to mobilize it, but it wasn't successful. Then he needed to uh, see the bladder via the cyto uh, cytoscope, uh, which is not so convenient procedure for the patient. But anyway, uh, he was shrugged because inside he saw a thermometer, thermometer, and around there was a settlement of a wrist-like or size stone because it was a foreign body in the bladder. And uh, the question how the thermometer uh, entered into the bladder, it wasn't from the rectum, it was through the 
urethra. The patient didn't want to tell or didn't know because didn't remember because of the special condition, maybe under drug or something, alcohol. But his partner probably introduced the thermometer through the uh, urethra into the bladder. Now, anyway, the story is not so nice. I saw otherwise the picture what he uh, uh, presented on the uh, conference, but uh, the story is not so nice because he operated the patient, but everywhere here under the peritoneum, uh, the guy had a chronic inflammation with fistulae and uh, probably he didn't uh, uh, recover properly. So this is what I wanted to tell. Of course, in female, we have the corresponding uh, stories. And in female, this is the corresponding length of the urethra only. So approximately this one without any flexure. So it's much easier uh, to introduce, for example, uh, the catheter if necessary. And uh, once uh, a female patient visited him and uh, with some inconvenient problems and, and he double checked uh, her uh, bladder and immediately called the nurse, what do you see? And she said, thermometer. So in female, it's easier to insert uh, any object here, a hairpin or a candle and so on with, because of masturbation. I don't want to tell this story because you will hear about this uh, in forensic medicine. So anyway, uh, this is about the flexures in men and that's why I went, uh, went to this uh, because uh, the first one can be erected but the second still present. So it's a little bit weird. Anyway, uh, what I want to tell here more is the uh, two surfaces of the uh, penis. Uh, this is the anterior one in flexive penis, the dorsal surface, and this is the urethral surface. Urethral surface is always uh, clear because even if it's erected, urethral surface is this because this is facing to the urethra or close to the urethra. The other one now is better to say dorsum or dorsal surface of the penis, but this is the opposite now. So that's why it's a bit misleading. Uh, we see the septum penis somewhere here, uh, which uh, separates the two corpora cavernosa. I will mention or show this in a uh, cross section. And uh, this is not a complete separation between the two big erectile bodies. We have some uh, communications, lots of pores. And we have the suspensory ligament of the penis, which supports the penis, uh, connects the penis to the symphysis. Again, I have a story because somebody wanted to measure the strength of his penis in erected position and put a bucket of water on his penis. But unfortunately, it was not enough strong. So that's why it was fractured, I mean ruptured, and uh, the ligament was elongated. Otherwise, this procedure is used for the elongation of the penis, but definitely the efficiency of the erection this way is weakened because this is very important otherwise. Now, anyway, I don't want to... Uh, Tell more. Uh, yeah, I see here the rose. Uh, and uh, this friend told me that once there was a guy who visited him with a rose in his penis. So it was a rose outside. So it was a very nice decoration. But the problem was that it was a plastic uh, flower. And the stem was inside, inserted. Again, probably somebody wanted masturbation. I don't know what was the major uh, goal of this. But anyway. Uh, the end was inside, but the problem was that he was not able to remove it because at the end there was a metal hook, so sh should have been operated. Uh, anyway, don't be stupid uh, for this uh, or in this topic. Here you see some other uh, anatomical structures, prepuce or foreskin. Uh, this is in retracted position and uh, in different cultures or because of hygienic reasons, it can be removed. It is called circumcision. And behind the, the corona, which is this margin, we have the sulcus coronaris, coronary sulcus. And at the bottom, so it means on the urethral surface, we have a little break, which still keeps the prepuce to the glass pen. It's called frenulo. If we don't have circumcision, this is the situation of the uh, foreskin. So this is the outer layer. And in the retracted position, this is now the outer. Then we have the inner layer of the foreskin. Between them, we have this ring, which is called frenar ring, ring or band. This is located now here. And uh, if we have circumcision, then the inner layer is still present. This is what I, want, what I wanted to tell. 
and where we had the Frenner band, this corresponds to the circumcision scare, so the, only the outer uh, layer of the foreskin is missing. And uh, the same with the frenulum in both cases, so even uh, after the circumcision, the frenulum is left because the inner layer of the foreskin is present still, only the outer is missing in case of the circumcision. Now, uh, let's go to the function of the penis and I like to uh, uh, explain the anatomical background of it first. Uh, if we have a cross, a cross section in the middle of the penis, somewhere here, we see the two big erectile bodies, the two corpora cavernosa, and between them, uh, the third one with the urethra, this is the corpus spongius. As you see, the two corpora cavernosa are surrounded by this very thick covering, which has then a septum. So this is the septum penis, doesn't show but we have communication between the, or communications between the two uh, sides. And this tunica albuginea, otherwise a very dense collagenous connective tissue covering. This is missing around the corpus spongiosum because otherwise it wouldn't let the uh, uh, propel of the seminal fluid during the erection. So it is not surrounded by this strong, thick covering, only the two corpora cavernosa. Otherwise, we see the skin of the uh, uh, penis. Underneath, we have a, a little fascia and then some con uh, loose connective tissue. And then we have the deep fascia called box fascia and we have a vein above this level. <clears throat> this is the superficial dorsal vein of the penis. This is drained to the external pudendal vein. I like to highlight it. So that's why the penis rings work, works uh, uh, to block the drainage, uh, the venous drainage more efficiently. Uh, this is from this vein and uh, the other superficial veins, which are not seen in this picture. And then under the box fascia, we have the real, let's say, uh, dorsal vein of the penis, or this is a deep one. And uh, uh, we have two arteries, uh, again, uh, dorsal artery of penis, and two nerves, dorsal artery of the nerves. The nerves are from the pudendal nerve, uh, more precisely from the dorsal nerve of the penis, this. And uh, the arteries are branches of the internal pudendal artery. <clears throat> uh, we see two other vessels in the uh, big uh, cavernous bodies or erectile bodies. These are called uh, uh, arteria profunda penis or deep artery of penis. And uh, uh, both the dorsal and the deep artery are, are branches of the internal pudendal artery, uh, which is from the internal iliac. <coughs> we may find in some sections another artery, here it's not shown, the bulbo urethral artery. This is also a branch of the internal pudendal, but it's not important for the erection. And the two nerves are pudendal uh, nerve branches, dorsal nerve of penis, I mentioned this. It includes the parasympathetic fibers as well, so not only somatosensory at this level, originally it was somatomotor as well, to innervate you know, the uh, transversus penis profundus, including the uh, external urethral sphincter, at this level sensory only, plus it has parasympathetic visceral motor fibers, originally from the pelvic splanking nerves, from S2 to S4. This is very important for the erection. I think I mentioned almost everything. The green uh, is also important, so the lymphatic drainage of the uh, penis. Uh, I told you the rule. If you don't know uh, the uh, lymphatic uh, drainage primary lymph nodes, uh, then you have to think of the venous drainage. So the erectile bodies are related to the branches of the internal pudendal and then internal iliac arteries and veins. So that's why the primary lymph nodes of these regions would be the internal iliac and external iliac lymph nodes. But very superficially, the glans penis and the foreskin uh, will be drained to the inguinal lymph nodes, superficial and maybe deep inguinal lymph nodes. And that's why I used to teach this, that the uh, diaper-like area from where uh, the superficial inguinal lymph nodes uh, receive the lymph, including the lower abdominal wall under the navel, uh, then the external genitalia, such as this, uh, the perineal region, the anus, and the gluteal region. Uh, this is the area from where the lymph is drained to the uh, superficial and deep inguinal lymph nodes. We mentioned last time that the testis, which is uh, first 
seems to be very superficial uh, and uh, could be uh, maybe first uh, this, uh, this solution for the lymphatic drainage, I mean the superficial in the lymph lymphos, but if you regard the uh, venous drainage, we studied that it is from the inferior vena cava directly or to the inferior vena cava directly or indirectly and the vessels, the arteries are also from the abdominal aorta, so from a quite high level behind. That's why, not labeled here, the lymphatic drainage of testis is drained to the paraortic lymph nodes or lumbar lymph nodes, don't forget it. But the scrotum belongs to the superficial area. This is related to the superficial inguinal lymph nodes, the scrotum skin. Now, we have some slides uh, and uh, with different uh, cross sections, and that's why I want to explain this. If we cut the penis uh, uh, relatively proximally, then we see uh, the three erectile by the two big <coughs> uh, corpus cavernosum and uh, the smaller corpus spongiosum with the urethra. But if we go more distally uh, and we put back the uh, uh, glance penis to the original position, then at the level of the second uh, plane, uh, we see uh, the, again the two corpora cavernosa, a bit smaller, and the uh, corpus spongiosum with urethra, but above we see the glans penis already, so the glans penis appeared already. And if we go more distally, then the proportion changes, still the corpus cavernosum is present, below corpus spongiosum uh, with urethra, above glans penis with larger extent, and at the end, if we take the sample from the fourth level, we don't have any more corpus cavernosum, but the glans penis would be there, the hole is here, and in this case, the urethra is already at the level of the navicular fossa, if you remember that was the distalmost part, where we have stratified non-keratinized sclerosis epithelium compared to the rest of the urethra, in this case backward, until the prostate, uh, where we have stratified columnar epithelium. Uh, this is what we see, the tricky way. So the two corpora cavernosa surrounded by the tunica albuginea, and this is the septum penis, and below the corpus spongiosum with the urethra. And above we have the appearance of the glans penis already partly. And this is the surface of the glans penis, this epithelium lining. This is the inner surface of the foreskin. This is present. And uh, this is a or sin staining, that's why it visualizes the elastic elements, especially the corpus spongiosum. This is from our slide, and uh, this is with hematoxinosin, showing this little area here. So, septum penis and the two corpora cavernosa just partly included, with the spaces called cavernae, but I will return to this later. And this is the corpus spongiosum uh, with the urethra, and we studied in the first semester that we have multicellular endoepithelial glands, and we have also glands of litter a bit far from the urethra. So you see with a higher magnification that both the septum penis and the tunica albuginea consist of a very densely packed, uh, wavy, uh, pinkish collagen fibers. This is with high magnification, the urethra, you see the stratified columnar epithelium lining, uh, oval nuclei in one row on the top, otherwise the rest of the nuclei are different. And you see some pale areas, but multicellular, these are the endoepithelial glands. And with farer, we have uh, branched tubular glands also with mucous secretion. These are the glands of litter, they open also into the urethra. Uh, corpus spongiosum compared to the corpus cavernosum, both otherwise uh, show the two major components of the erectile tissue, so caverni and trabecules, but in the corpus spongiosum the elastic elements don't, uh, are the dominant uh, fibers, collagen, uh, connective tissue fibers in the trabeculae, and in case of the corpus cavernosum, collagen fibers are dominant, plus in both cases smooth muscle. So trabecules are these irregular structures uh, having connective tissue fiber and smooth muscle in it, and caverni are the spaces. Apparently these are empty, but this is where the blood is found. Uh, here it's missing, but it still contains blood otherwise, and we have endothelium lining. What is interesting is that we see some protrusions. These are the Ebner's cushions, 
and these protrusions are made by the tonic activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which keeps the smooth muscle cells contracted, and that's why these are protruding. This will be the key for the uh, erection if the smooth muscle contraction is blocked and the sympathetic activation also, of course, at the beginning. So cavernae and trabecules, these are the two major components of the erectile tissues in both otherwise. Uh, we have some slides where the gland spin is seen only, but first I wanted to tell something because this will explain the situation that uh, in this case, the gland spin is still tightly attached to the uh, prepuce, the foreskin, but here in this uh, preparation, here we, we have already separation between the foreskin and the gland spin is, but from this point still attached. But we have something where we don't have this reflection. This is the frenulum uh, or break of the foreskin. So what do you see here? Uh, the foreskin outer surface is the regular skin, uh, basically with hair, follicles, with uh, sweat glands and sebaceous glands, but no uh, subcutis, sorry. Uh, so that's why no fat deposit cannot thicken this way pigmented skin and it is uh, usually loosely attached. Uh, the inner surface is still keratinized but no glands, just modified uh, sebaceous glands and no uh, hair follicles. And the, out, the surface of the gland spin is still keratinized, thin keratinization is found, so certified uh, squamous epithelium and no hair follicles, obviously only modified sebaceous glands. And this uh, uh, epithel epithelium lining is tightly attached to the underlying connective tissue elements. Of course, it's logic because uh, it has a mechanic uh, stimulus relatively often. Okay. Uh, in adult, I wanted to show you, that is a, only a schematic drawing, but we have preparations also. You see the uh, cellular adhesion completely disappeared. So, uh, the gland uh, penis surface is completely separated from the inner surface of the foreskin, but this is the frenulum vein. Uh, and I wanted to highlight this because we will be parents uh, with little boys, so we have to know that uh, around the birth we have a significant cellular adhesion still uh, between the uh, uh, gland uh, penis surface and the inner foreskin, unless these are uh, circumcised. But usually this detachment is uh, terminated by the age of uh, year five in the majority of, this, uh, of the, of the uh, little guys, boys. And if it's not, then you should uh, uh, help to separate it. Otherwise, it can cause trouble with the hygienics. Now let's go to the erection mechanism. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, mention that in flexid penis, the size of the cavernae are relatively small, this is not so well elaborated, because of the protrusions of the abnex cushions. So with the tonic uh, activation of the sympathetic nervous system, with the tonic contraction of the smooth muscle cells, these cushions are protruding. But if we have parasympathetic stimulus and sympathetic blockade, then uh, the smooth muscle cells will be relaxed. And uh, what happens? The leading uh, arteries, so from the deep uh, artery of penis or profundo penis, we have tiny uh, snail-like arteries called helicin arteries and uh, these will dilate and also they open into the cavernae. The cavernae open up because the, the uh, abnerse cushions will be flattened and if the smooth muscle in the abnus cushion is uh, relaxed then the cushion will be flattened and retracted to the peripheral part so won't protrude anymore. What happens? The cavernae open up, the size of the lumen is much higher and that's why more blood can enter. This is the first phase of direction, increased input. And then if you look at that, the central cavernae are filled up with blood but the uh, peripheral cavernae, this is not so well uh, seen, are compressed to the tunica albugina. That's why we need tunica albugina, that the peripheral com 
uh, uh, Carnarvon should be compressed. From there, we have the majority of the venous drainage. So if we compress the venous uh, drainage, then we have decreased output. And this is the second phase. Both together will be the, the intumescence of the penis. In the biochemical, uh, the biochemical background of it is the uh, release of the NO from the nerve endings. You know, the, the dorsal nerve of penis leads to there. And this activates the enzyme, the gonadal cyclase, which uh, uh, transforms GTP to CGMP, and this will result in the relaxation of the smooth muscle cells. And then we have increased input, then decreased output if we have the compression of the peripheral veins, uh, caverni, and uh, this leads to the erection. Uh, what causes the uh, release of the NO from the parasympathetic nerve endings? It can be manic stimulus, can be acoustic, visual, or even dream. So different stimulus, I don't need to detail this because everybody knows. But uh, the stimulus is required for the erection uh, because here I labeled in this uh, figure the uh, effect of or the background of the mechanism of action of the new uh, class of drugs to increase erection or uh, extend the erection. Uh, such as the Viagra, uh, those uh, which are able to block the type 5 phosphodiesterase, this way the CGMP is not uh, broken down to GMP. So something similar to the caffeine, which is able to block the transformations of C, uh, AMP to AMP. In this case, CGMP uh, is not converted to uh, uh, GMP. And, uh, but we need enough CGMP first to relax the smooth muscle cells, and not, as my friend told me, uh, he uh, prescribed a Viagra to a patient, and uh, he was very satisfied. I mean, he took the pill, then sat down in front of the TV with one bottle of beer and uh, switched on the TV to see soccer, and he was disappointed nothing happened, and visited him again, and he said, no, no any. Uh, because, of course, a sucker is not the best way to stimulate the sexual activity. So anyway, uh, we need a sexual activity to this. And then if the erection then can be prolonged. This is the same. Uh, we need simultaneously parasympathetic activation, sympathetic uh, inhibition. And the sympathetic activation, which uh, uh, you know, results in the uh, release of NO, uh, it's not only one uh, you know, mechanism that is for the erection, but simultaneously we have activation of several glands around, uh, bulbo urethral glands, urethral glands. And this is important for the lubrication in the urethra. That's why during the ejaculation, the seminal fluid won't be stuck to the wall of the urethra. And simultaneously we have the uh, inhibition of the sympathetic nervous system. So these two together will lead to the uh, relaxation of the smooth muscle cells. This is the same, uh, this is a secondary consequence, uh, the uh, compression of the uh, veins. <clears throat> uh, so this is what I uh, mentioned to you already, that uh, the penis rings uh, work uh, or uh, additional help to the uh, blockade of the uh, venous uh, drainage. And I just remember he told me another interesting story uh, somebody who didn't enough pay, uh, I mean money for buying a real penis ring, he tried to put on his penis a metal uh, ring which uh, holds the heaters, the radiators on the wall. And uh, unfortunately, after or during the erection, it was so swollen that he was not able to remove it anymore. And he visited my friend. And uh, it was quite painful because, uh, and, and bluish already. Uh, so he didn't know what to do with this patient. He tried to remove it, but no any mo uh, mobility. He then uh, he tried to use a rasper, but he wasn't able to cut anything. So then he thought maybe the best way to go to the maintenance to get the special uh, saw, you know, electric saw, and when he returned with this instrument, the patient collapsed in his truck and the blood pressure uh, went down and then he was able to press through the ring his penis. So this way the treatment was helpful. Uh, 
and without usage of this harmful instrument. So this is again a real story from Budapest. Now, uh, the main thing again, increased input, decreased output. And this is the uh, mechanism of the nervous system behind. For erection and lubrication of the urethra, we need to activate the parasympathetic nervous system in the sacral part. Of course, these are all uh, under no voluntary control. So this should be in this medial position, with a mistake, but otherwise, OK, we have uh, splanchnic pelvic nerve, which are associated to the uh, dorsal nerve of penis. At the end, we have the uh, ganglion here, somewhere in the wall of the organ. And this is where the, or from where the NO will be released in case of the activation, in case of erection, but we have other uh, innervations for the lubrication, for the glands. And uh, at the same time, we have to pluck the uh, sympathetic nervous system. For ejaculation, we have to activate the sympathetic nervous system, and we use the lowermost part of the sympathetic outflow, T12 to L2, or maybe L3 are included. We use the lumbar splanchnic nerve, what we don't teach, inferior mesenteric ganglion, and then this leads to the smooth muscle wall of the duct system of the male. So the uh, epididymis, uh, the vas deferens, prostate, seminal vesicle, everything uh, which has smooth muscle will be contracted. Now this is the main point. Erection is uh, due to the parasympathetic activation from S2 to S4 as uh, pelvic splanchnic nerves or nervi erigentes. These are otherwise found at the end in the dorsal nerve of penis. First, we have uh, increased input uh, and decreased output. Simultaneously, we have activation of the glands. The ejaculation is under sympathetic influence. So first, we have an emission phase when, uh, due to the sympathetic activation, the, the male genital duct system contracts and the seminal fluid, including the 5% from the uh, store, uh, epidermis stored spermatozoa. Additionally, you know, secretion from prostate 20, 30% and seminal vesicle 60, 70% are added because everywhere we have some sympathetic innervation. And uh, it has a second phase when from the urethra, uh, the uh, seminal fluid is uh, propelled to the, let's say, vaginal fornix uh, with rhythmic contraction of the mu musculus uh, bulbus spongiosus. This is somatomotor innervation already, but we are not able to control this, uh, this contraction in this case. And then we have the detumescence phase when the sympathetic activation increases again. I mean, uh, it is continuation of this. Uh, under sympathetic activation, uh, the uh, Ebner's cushions uh, protrude again <coughs> into the lumen, so the lumen size is smaller, we have less input, and consequently we have a uh, release of the uh, blockade of the venous drainage, so that's why altogether they lead to the tetumescence. Before I forget it, I'd like to highlight Stephen Hawking's statement, who said, and this is how you can memorize it easier if you don't want to think it over, because otherwise it's uh, logic, point is parasympathetic, so the erection, and shoot, so the ejaculation is sympathetic. Uh, he was a, a genius. Anyway, uh, one more thing which shows why we need sympathetic innervation for the internal urethral sphincter. This is the ejaculation, because uh, during the ejaculation, the seminal fluid is pumped into the uh, urethra, and if we don't have closed sphincter, then the seminal fluid would enter to the bladder, uh, which, because it's shorter and less resistance. Uh, but we have to uh, contract it simultaneously with the ejaculation. If it doesn't work, because uh, it's a consequence of prostatic surgery, uh, with the removal of the prostate, the smooth muscle sphincter, the internal lateral sphincter, can be impaired. Uh, this patient may have reflux of the seminal fluid to the bladder in case of ejaculation. We have two types, showers and growers. Otherwise, the average length is 13 to 15 centimeters. You know, the showers have uh, in flexed penis a bigger size and they don't grow too much. But those who are the growers have in flexed uh, situation or condition smaller penis, which may increase more. It's okay. 
so don't worry, 13 to 15 centimeter the erected penis size. And uh, the last picture, it shows that we, we have something where Hungary is the first. It's not Hungarian, uh, otherwise analysis. So it is from uh, somewhere from the Western countries. Uh, Hungary is the, the highest, at least, in the uh, penis size. So it's 16 to 16.5 uh, uh, centimeters, approximately. Next is France. Uh, after this good news, I want to uh, Thank for your attention.